In this house, we believe that the fundamental problem of political philosophy is that which Spinoza saw so clearly, which Reich rediscovered, and which I have said for the third time in a row because we've had to restart the recording a couple of times. Why do people fight for their servitude as if it were their salvation? Are we all political masochists? Am I a masochist for reading that out three times? Well, we're going to explore masochism again today, folks. We are co continuing our ongoing collaboration with the Members School by talking about masochism, libidinal economy, finance, and racial capitalism with Taja Mars McDougall. Taja, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Ah, oh, happy to be here for what feels like the third time, as I've said that a couple of times now. But yes, <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, let's let's chat. No, so, so you recently finished your, your dissertation, of course. Can you just give us a bit of an introduction to the kind of problematics you're working with, the fields you're working in? and just... Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I finished my dissertation in, what, 2022, I guess. Um, so it's an insanity document. And um, what happened with it is I was trying to write about Black time. And then I ran sort of headlong into the money problem um, with slavery, where I was just sort of caught up in why do we keep calling slaves commodities when they don't seem to function like commodities? They seem to function more like money. And then that became sort of an interrogation of Black studies fixation on specific kinds of um, commodity functions of slaves. And then a sort of reorientation of this, commo this commodity form of, of the slave toward a financial form, where I sort of conclude with the idea that, you know, blackness itself, not just the slave, functions as like a libidinal currency um, or a libidinal money, better is a better way to put it. So... It was it started with this critique of black studies as like this as a sort of a family model that sort of breaks down through the the dissertation into a kind of a meeting of strangers in the market kind of model. So that was that was the diss. Mm. It's interesting, yeah, this, this shift from, yeah, this almost typical sort of Marxist framing of essentially, like, you know, even even if you get something, you know, Fred Moten talking about the commodity that speaks, which Marx misses, that this is reshifting it to a financial instrument is, is really interesting. And I think what's, what we're going to look, talk about today, of course, folks, is going to be this fusion of Deleuze with a particular moment in Black Studies around this idea of masochism, which, as you highlight in the talk you sent to us, uh, comes out of Anthony Farley's work, particularly this paper, if people can find it, you know, it's called the, the Black Body as Fetish Object. So what drew you to thinking about these things in terms of masochism already after you've made the shift to thinking about these things in more financial terms? Well, I had chosen to revisit this, paper, this Anthony Farley paper um, for the member school. And I had read it a, a few times, but I had read it again for this class where I was going to be talking about desire and pleasure. Um, and the class was titled, what is blackness? And I was, you know, sort of going through different concepts that are sort of in orbit around what we think of as racial blackness. And I had read coldness and cruelty a long time ago. Um, and then Noah actually sort of said, Hey, why don't we look at this? And I was like, okay, let me revisit it. And so I like, you know, blazed through it. And then I got sort of halted on this question of the contract and the institution as aligning with masochism and sadism respectively. And you know, I had I had I had really liked Farley's paper at first, but then as I revisited Coldness and Cruelty, I got started to get suspicious of what what he was doing in this very early paper because um, it's you know it's from like 1997. I started to I I started to really sort of buy what Deleuze was saying about breaking the state of masochistic entity apart, and so then sort of developed this sort of critique of Farley 
um, you know, a hundred years too late, but um, always on time, I guess. So that's, so that the shift into this question about the contract, as I'm thinking about finance, uh, you know, financial instruments, I'm thinking about derivatives and derivatives markets. I'm thinking about um, options. I started to really delve into the contract as so much of what we like to think of as emancipation in the United States and in, you know, in uh, the Americas is about the sort of signing of the social contract and what, how that is supposed to be this founding moment of black freedom. That was then, you know, it was, a you know, under city, under city of Hartman's gaze, it's a non-event. So like, what does that all kind of mean? So I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about contract and social contract. Um, and so that's kind of how that started to develop. And now I've sort of lost my mind reading about contracts, gifts, promises, these things um, to think about um, black freedom, quote unquote. Yeah, I, I was going to, you know, maybe we can start off by having you give us a rundown of what the original masochist argument is or how masochism is originally used in the realm of black studies that you're encountering it in. Mm -hmm. And then sort of when, Del how, and then kind of walking us through maybe how to lose, why does he emphasize the contract so much as opposed to the other thinkers who weren't when they were thinking about it? Like, why do they all overlook that? Yeah. Um, in, in that, in that theme. Yeah. Um, well, so in black studies, you know, Matt, there's a lot of, sort of trying to stay away from masochism because it's it tends to imply some kind of complicity or some sort of desire for um, the violence, the punishment, the, you know, the oppression and so on. There's flirtations with it. Um, the one thing I revisited recently was um, Amber Musser's, uh, Amber Jamila Musser, uh, her text Sensational Flesh, I think is the title, but I was yeah, reading it. Yeah, I read that as well, yeah. And so there's... There's discussion about it. I think the people who probably get the closest are those kind of in either in direct conversation with Farley or um, who think of Farley as a fellow traveler, uh, the Afro pessimists. I think they probably get the closest to talking about something like masochism um, because it feels distasteful. And Farley's article, if you sort of follow the um, the citations and go into reading like Gary in your pocket, which he really uses as the, the quintessential example of black masochism is this sort of desiring of punishment, um, eroticization of white violence um, and white sexuality. It's really, uh, it's really hard to read. It's really like quite frightening. <laughs> like Gary Fisher's, um, Gary Fisher's diaries are beautiful, but they're also this sort of testament to the frustration, the death. And he, you know, he eventually does die of, of AIDS in the early nineties um, that he was specifically at sort of after maybe not, isn't the right way to put it, but he was sort of okay with the, his, his own self-destruction. And this is, you know, in the, the era of Black Lives Matter, uh, even as that's kind of drawn to a maybe a an, an ebb, um, talking about Black people desiring our own um, destruction and our own um, our own su suffering and punishment is is um, it's hard to talk about. It's really difficult to talk about, and and I'm not saying I think that we desire our own destruction. Um, but there's certainly an element of that in there. And then, so with, De could you just restate the second part of your question about Deleuze? Cause I just want to make sure I actually answer things. <laughs> right. And I'll, and I'll maybe actually this, this might be flowing in a, I'll ask this first is there's a black masochism, right? That, that is the focus here. Mm -hmm. And, but Deleuze, what Deleuze is doing is, is a broader, a broader masochism, how how do we, you know, and I, we understand maybe why their black study groups have been using masochism, but what is very particular about 
masochism for, uh, in the context of, of black studies, I guess. Like, why, why is it so useful? Um, even if we're scared of using it, I, I perhaps. Yeah. Um, well, in a, in a provocative kind of way, if, if, you know, you accept the kind of Afro-pessimist tenet that the world is inherently anti-black and, and, um, the black will always be in the, in the position or non-position of slave with the, this world existing, right? Um, the question is why don't we enact some? Why don't why don't why isn't there a slave revolt? Why aren't we burning it down? Right? Why are we willing to accept um, our own suffering, our own um, our own punishment, our own the, the violence directed against us? And one of the answers to that question is going to eventually circle around the, the problem of masochism around, um, again, perhaps not complicity, but some kind of wanting it, some kind of desire. And that's what's so, so you know, that's part of where the animus against Afro-pessimism sort of derives from is like you're calling black people masochists and that we want this. Um, when, you know, look at all of our, our liberation movements, look at all of our, um, our NGOs, look at all of our, you know, our task forces, we don't want this. And, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the, the hideous thing about it and why it's proves to be such a thorn in the side, but masochism is a useful heuristic to think about why it is precisely we don't burn down the plantation if we're accepting that the world is a plantation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah 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 and then you know there's some there's something maybe not to jump the gun too much but there's something about you know there this uh, the this is the contract becomes i think important because there's this option in all of Masak's stories that gets enacted at the end that's just tearing up the contract um and i kind of maybe as sean has described at the end of our last episode he kind of hinted at like what happens when it's really a ruse and there wasn't that option in the first place is i think kind of where it gets interesting and what makes the contract useful um and and delusive so maybe now tell me what Deleuze is doing with the contract and like, why, why is he finding it so important? Yeah. Okay, great. Yes. I remember that this was the, the initial second half of the, that question. So with, for Deleuze, like, you know, he's trying to pull out this, this, this definition of masochism that at the time of the, the writing of coldness and cruelty hadn't quite been worked out in the way that, you know, sadism and, and, the uh, had been, and there was considerably less attention to Masoch, um versus, you know, Saad, where there's been tons of attention because, um, because of course, why not? Why wouldn't there be? So he, you know, Deleuze sort of echoes the four sort of most important features of masochism from Reich, from um, Masochism in Modern Man, which are, let me make sure I can remember them off to the top of my head, it are the, you know, the, the importance of the fantasy as being like the center of gravity for masochism. There's the, provo- the provocative aspect, um, which is, you know, sort of eliciting the torture <laughs> itself. The demonstrative aspect, which is not supposed to be confused with exhibitionism, but, um, is more of a theatrics of the whole thing. You know, um, if you've ever uh, found yourself for reasons that are your own in a BDSM scene, it is a, very much a scene, you know, it is the, you know, the moment of it all is, is built up. Oh my God. I mean, yeah, it's, you know, it's a whole, a whole production. Right. Um, and then the fourth one is of course the one I'm going to forget. Um, me think persuasive there's right provocative per- no oh, i forget the fourth one does anyone want to remind me I, it's not like i just wrote a suspense. paper on this thing. sorry suspense suspense that's the one suspense. delayed gratification <laughs> delayed gratification you know that's i'm the cheating one I i've got your paper in front of me <laughs> thank you thank god because my books are all out hidden upstairs in my little cubby hole so um so then, yeah, suspense, the waiting. Um, this is where there's the play of anxiety and tension happening. Um, 
so these are the four uh, features of masochism that Reich has in the, what is it, the 1941 text, 1944, that Deleuze picks up and says, yes, these are all, I think we can accept all of these, but there's a fifth one, which is the contract. And Deleuze doesn't quite say this one is the def- is the definitive feature. I say this one is the definitive feature. Um, Deleuze it pays certain attention to it, absolutely. But it's but I'm saying, well, you know what? I think this might even supersede fantasy because <laughs> the especially if you're dealing with an actual sadist, the contract is a fantasy. Um, the the contract is this central feature of masochism that we're going to have a duration of time where I can be punished, and then we will the punishment will stop. My de- my desires will have been gratified. You, as my torturess, will have taken part um, because in in masoc the 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 torturess is a woman. Um, you know, and that will be the end. That's our period of performance. And this really caught my attention. It really caught my attention because one of the things I have noticed in the way that certain kinds, certain, um, let's say, political struggles have worked, especially Black political struggles, is there has been this, this attention to like, look, this is the end point of of slavery. This is where it is supposed to end. 1865, it's not supposed to be anymore. That's the that's our signing our contract is that part is concluded. We have our social contract now. This is and we're supposed to be able to be full citizens. And there's all of this pointing to this contract that was it's that was in on the one hand there's no contract in slavery. But on the other hand, there is no social contract. And if there are black black people who were who were freed at emancipation, we're not signatories to it. White abolitionists were signatories to it. Black people were objects of exchange in it. Um, <laughs> the contract, the social contract, if one were to exist, is not something that slaves signed in order to become citizens. It was, it was, for lack of a better way to put it, a sort of impossible gift um, that even if we go and try and find it, we're never going to find. It's not there. There, what, there is no social contract. Um, so that's why I started paying such close attention to contract in Deleuze and being like, hmm, well, let's think about this. If we take it out of the bedroom, um, we take it out of the bedroom. We take it out of like the moral masochism of Freud, and we and we take it into the like specifically black political register, when where we have this idea about contracts and this idea about the social contract particularly, and what do we do with this? Because this seems to de- to to illuminate the way towards something that we're not quite dealing with in black studies. You just said something that really sparked a connection for me, the idea that the contract supersedes all other aspects of the masochism. Um, and when I think about, for our exi- for example, our liberal education here in the United States, and that there has never been a contract that any former slave or any Black person has signed, nonetheless, we still have a social pedagogy of the contract in our education in the sense that when we come to the point in history where we talk about the Civil War, we talk about the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Okay, now we take a test and we do a group project on it, and now we move on. Next, we're on to the Voting Rights Act, Martin Luther King Jr. and all of that. There's a test on that. There's a little paper and a presentation and speech. And in a sense, even though none of those things stack up to an actual signed contract, they are all speech acts that kind of agglomerate into one another to to form this kind of pseudo contract that's firmly embedded in the racial imaginary. Um, and I, I just kind of want to, to run that idea by you, because I think when we look at, for example, um, you know, the challenges with 
the Black Lives Matter, not only as a broader movement, but as a specific organization and other like largely liberal organizations that deal with racial struggles. I mean, you even mentioned in your paper how the, this particular masochistic logic gets embedded in, in to a, kind of is conterminous with like an NGO logic. And I, I was hoping you could say more about that because I thought that was really the most salient point that you made because that itself, that's, that's where I think the rubber meets the road with all this stuff is what kind of organization takes place? How do we pierce the veil on, uh, for example, how certain organizations um, recuperate the notion of a contract in a way? And what are the, how does it cash out in terms of praxis? So it's, fu- it's, it, it's not funny. It's actually the opposite of funny. It's quite horrifying that that very specific, um, you know, the, the civil war happens. You don't really, de- you don't really delve into the failed project of reconstruction. You don't, you don't really. And I mean, I was educated in Canada, so my education slightly different. There was no slavery there. Don't know what you're talking about. We're the best. Um, don't look at the residential schools that will bother you. Don't look at, um, the slaves that were in Quebec or anything like that. Don't just don't do that. That's just not worth your time. Um, this is Canada, brand Canada. We did it. Uh, peacekeepers. But, you know, you go from the failed project of reconstruction that out to the Civil Rights Act, which is, you know, almost 100 years. And in all of that, there is a sort of constant racial terror going on, right? That is not... Um, that is not really what you're going to learn about in 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 your sort of K through 12 education. Sure, I I I agree. Yes, kindergartners should not be learning about lynching. Um, but you know, there's a point in I think probably in high school where we could start talking about this, but you don't. But it appears like what by removing that hundred years what it makes it look like is, yeah, there's this pseudo contract and look, you, you go from 13th, 14th, 15th, 15th amendment to the voting rights act. And look, you're, you're getting all of this and it works like a contract. Oh, you did it. You did it. And that missing hundred years where as Sadia Hartman does argue, um, particularly in the years just following slavery out into, you know, the 1920s, 1930s before, just before um, like the great migration starts to, really pick up steam, um, where a lot of black people left the South and moved into the Northern cities. Um, you basically have a bunch of like a retrenchment of all of the mechanics of slavery, all the mechanics of slavery without the name, right? Where you have the sharecropping system, you have, you have the, you know, the origins of what will be the, the, the prison system as it looks now, right? You have all of these things happening. Plus you have, yeah, you have total racial terror. You have, you know, people in um, in the post-Confederate states writing to the, you know, the Bureau of, um, the, the, the Bureau of Freedmen saying, uh, we actually need help. Could you not shut this Bureau down because the KKK are murdering us? <laughs> They are just killing people like you. You have people writing all of these letters into Congress, trying to make sure that the, the Bureau, of, the Freedmen's Bureau stays active, um, even though they're at best a. Um, an NGO ish kind of band aid over over the whole problem, right? Um, by like taking out that hundred years. Yeah, you get what looks like this this pseudo contract where, it you know, Freedom is sort of leg- legislated into into practice and into life, and yet, even now, you know, sixty years post, um, you know, post civil rights, we still have an incredible amount of anti black violence, and we still have the mobilization of blackness at, for anything but itself. Um, this is this is sort of laying bare that there is no, there is no social contract for me. That doesn't look like a social contract to me. And, you know, I'll move into the NGO stuff in a second, but like I'll I'll be provocative because it's an election year. The democratic party is the worst, the worst offender here. 
where, you know, well, black voters say this, therefore they are the, they're the plant, they are the plantation party. That's what they are. And they, they use blackness in this, it, they deploy it in the same kind of way to do this, to do this work. And as a currency, as a money to make sure that they get the votes they think they deserve because it's what's right. Like they, they, that whole logic is submerged directly into the Democratic Party. Um, that's what, you know, South Car- the South Carolina primary is all about, is getting those black votes. See, look. And it's just another use of blackness. And then from there, the, the, you know, um, the, the contract itself, and I don't just mean the social contract, I mean the contract as a form, is, a, is part of making of modern subjects. You know, it is the correct way in which one engages the state. It is the correct way in which one engages another person, especially if we're going to concede that we are all strangers meeting in a market. Um, the only way to make sure that we don't complete. Can I curse? Awesome. The w- best way to make sure we don't fuck each other over, especially if we're strangers and we have no obligations to each other, is to have a contract, a piece of paper that says, you do this, I do this, perfect, done, the bargain. This is the making of of the modern subject. And the whole, you know, NGO industrial complex is, is founded upon this view of the individual as a contracting subject and the state as what we contract with, a counterparty to contracts as well as, and this is the part that they, for, they tend to forget, the institution that makes contracts enforceable, that enforces contracts. So like the NGO, the, the movement that is saying like, you owe us, this is, in, this is in the fine print. No, it fucking isn't. It never was. There's no contract. And so when you, this is how you mobilize is like, um, and this is what you think of as political action is saying, you owe us this because you said here, and that's the con. That's where you're you're, you're making a mistake. There was no contract. There was no. There's no stipulations. You're talking to an institution, a sadistic institution, that part of its role is enforcing contracts. You're you're not contracting with it. You can't. No, one of the things I enjoyed the most about your paper was specifically this idea of rereading everything financially in in the lens of contract. That you know, money is a credit contract, and this idea that and we spoke about before the show how you present the state as essentially gifting recognition or enforcement of various contracts. And so this, but this, I wanted to actually go a bit further into what it means to say that the current set of institutions are statistic, because one of the things I really enjoyed reading was you talk about you know, the old joke about sadists and masochists. The masochist says hurt me, the sadist says no. The masochist, in, in, in the context of political blackness, says you need to hold this contract, and then the sadistic institution says no. So what does it mean to really talk about these institutions in terms of uh, sadism? Is 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 sadism kind of inherent to what it means to be an institution in that sense? Is there are there no, are there no masochistic institutions, only sadistic ones that produce masochism? I think one of the few masochistic institutions you might find is the scene itself, right? The BDSM scene, and that's sort of by virtue of being what it is, is not an institution, right? But yes, I do increasingly think that in institutions, institutionality is sadistic. Is it, it's it's not always for punishment, but it is they like the, the network of institutions is meant is meant in so many ways to be what we might we what we want to say is you know at least the hands and the feet and the the mouth of the sovereign like it is it's that it's that and and that's not a a pleasant thing to think about because that means it really it doesn't have to adhere to any law it does not care the contract is about is about law the state 
doesn't. The institutions of the state do not and do not care for laws, um, which is why I go on to say in the paper that like the state is and the institution is pure optionality. It can do whatever it wants, no matter what contract you think is there, um, including, you know, tearing it up um, and telling you to go fuck yourself. Um, there's no contract. They don't. The, the institution itself doesn't believe in contracts. It is not a counterparty. It, if you make the mistake of thinking it's a counterparty to the contract, you are going to make massive political mistakes. It isn't. It is, it is the pure option of always being willing to pay the price to breach a contract. You might use the state to enforce a contract, but it's not, it, do, it doesn't have to. It can tell you to go away and it can kill you. Um, so, you know, that is sort of the, that is kind of the joke, right? Is if you misapprehend what an institution is and you say, ah, this is my, this is my cold mother, the torturess. Um, and I may not, uh, I may not love her when she hurts me, but I, you know, I love her. Um, she, she, this is not, this is not her. <laughs> you are not talking to her. Um, you are talking to an institution and that institution does not have to listen to you and does not have to think of itself as counterparty to you, your contract at all. It, it is always worth it for the institution to breach the contract. There's no price not worth paying. Um, yeah, there's just none. So yes, I do think institutions are sadistic. Even the university that pays my checks um, oh yeah. yeah, it it does feel like it does tend to have more of a. I'm oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was say it does seem to have more of, as you're saying with the Democratic Party earlier. It seems to be, make more of a sense to talk about liberal institutions. Than it does even to some extent conservative or rightist ones. Even to the extent that, I mean, in, in the UK, you know, it's it's easier to to bribe a Tory MP than it is to bribe a Labour politician. They are so ruthlessly committed to the operations of the British state that they will say, "Well, we're nicer than the other guys," and then they'll hand the police as much money as they want. You know, or same with the Democrat. The, the, the contract with you know, with with Trump is, "I'm going to make people you don't like really fucking mad, and I'm going to be cruel to them if you if you give me this." The Democratic Party is, "We'll do what the fuck we want." But we're not. We're not even going to make you a contract. It's going to be. Well, we're not the other guy, and that, because we're not the other guy, we're not going to make contracts. So the liberalism, to the extent, is kind of believes in itself so much because, of course, it is the representation of of you, which is more real than than you, of course, because the representation. You know, in, we were representative democracy. Whoever owns representation owns democracy, and it kind of feels like this. This applies mostly to liberalism. Like if you're talking plenty of conservatives, it's like there's there's something of an exchange there of like a currency of cruelty, whereas the cruelty is almost only going in one direction. We talk about liberal or social democratic kind of ways of viewing it. So I think it's 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 hard not to get more you know in the, i mean it's election year in the uk as well than the the raw sad, the raw sadism of the labor party is never more present <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh yeah i mean yeah i last time i was in the uk they it was it was still the corbin years and you know or was it the movement was like out on the street and it was it was really lovely to like meet some of the people who who were you know canvassing and and you know getting people out to, you know, vote labor. But you're right, you know, <laughs> I am speaking about the liberal institution. Um, but I also don't want to m make the mistake of saying that, you know, conservatives are in some, some way, not just liberals. They're just a different kind of, they're a different kind of liberal, right? They're, they're not, you know, their, their differences are in style, not really in, in substance. They're not, they don't seem overly committed to like, you know, taking apart parliament or something like that, even though, you know, that if nothing else could be fun to try and then watch them try, <laughs> you know, it could be exciting um, or terrible or both. I mean, why not both? Um, but yeah, it is definitely liberal institutions because our institutions are liberal in the worst sense of liberal. Um, there was, you know, being Canadian, there was, uh, we had our very own couple of 
real real freaks and perverts at in the conservative party in charge of of the government for a long time and when i last lived there it was stephen harper this you know this basically outline of a man who looked like his hair clipped on like a lego guy and i would i at the time i was in a in a relationship with uh with someone who's parents were died in the wool liberals, like, you know, hated Stephen Harper. Hey, just, Oh, he's the worst. He's the worst. He's the worst. Blah, 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 all of that. And trying to tell them that this, this is all liberal. That's all liberalism guys. It's not, this is not, it was an impossible conversation. There was no conversation to be had. No one could hear it. You know, hearing that Trump is a liberal or, uh, Who's the, who's the freak in charge of the Conservative Party over in the UK these days? Is it Rishi Sunak? Is it Rishi, Rishi, yeah, Rishi Sunak. Yeah, Sunak. Yeah, I mean, you know, liberal. He's liberal. He just he's just nastier. You know, he's not he's not um, he's not you know trying to put on this kind face and making make the institution mm. smile at you, which is really just it baring its teeth. Um, yeah, so I'm just rambling now about. Conservatives and liberals, because I mean, no liberals as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I have a brief follow up, but no, if you want to go for it, go for it. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm just something that we also discussed in the members group, and I think that's even unseated here is like there's a the foundational myth that there is a contract, right? Um, um, the the institution enforces contracts, yet is constituted itself by a contract, and that contract doesn't exist. Um, and we kind of discover this, we discover the contract doesn't exist and we're fucked. So, you know, what, because the you, I think it was previously maybe described in the reading group we did that like, you know, tearing up the contract is an act of liberation in the, in the context of the black subject. Um, but it, it, that seems to be not necessarily what hap- what happens like the, the, that contract, what contract are you tearing up? So what does liberation look like then, or, or what, or what's next? You know, that it kind of gets murky now, uh, I guess. Um, um, and then the other thing, I don't know, just mulling over that. And the other thing I'm thinking about is, we don't want to be sadists. We don't want to be doing, you know, I don't know. There's a large amount of groups in popular scenes in, in New York, for instance, that love being pro self-proclaimed sadists and like doing politics around that and stuff and like reactionary senses. Yeah. Very strange. And Yikes. so, <laughs> yeah, one of my initial in, intervention or interests in, in this, and I guess as you discussed and with tiger is like supplementing spatai with masochism. Like when do we want to be a masochist perhaps? Um, and it's like, do we all want to be masochist to each other? And like, that's, is that just, is that just what you were talking about? The modern subject um, with contracts, like it is that still a losing battle? Like, cause we don't want to be the institution. Um, and so maybe this, uh, this begs the question that was also raised in the reading group, like what's outside of masochism and sadism. Um, mm-hmm. But maybe what's like next, what's next in your thought? Cause this book with this chapter we've read was a chapter, right? What, what are you yeah yeah so like what's where do you see this going with Deleuze because you also kind of point out that Deleuze you know doesn't go far enough or maybe doesn't understand what the contract means in the context of slavery um and kind of overlooks it but yeah what's next what's next perhaps what's next I mean that's probably the most nightmarish question you can ask somebody on the job market is like so what's where's your research going next it's like to hell (laughs) I don't know (laughs) I'm trying to get paid more man um no that's not that's not fair but well yes it is but so (sighs) I have to reveal something about myself here Um, we're going to get really personal and I'm really sorry where it goes next is leotard because at the end of the day, um, I am, am I a leotardian? That's, that's aggressive, but there's something that, that Deleuze and particularly the Deleuze of this era, you know, the sort of the era around 68, the anti-Oedipus thousand plateaus kind of time timing doesn't and can't quite see in terms of, you know, the way that, um, you know, volatility and contingency and finance is going to kick off in 1973. And so 
you can't, he can't quite see it yet. And I'm not saying Leotard can exactly see it, but he can see something there. And so this book will be sort of, um, it's sort of a prequel to what the next two projects really are. And the first one being like my big dissertation book on finance and blackness, very specifically like in terms of, of collateral assets, um, derivatives, markets, options, trading, and so on. And then there is another project that's sort of waiting in the wings about Leotard, Fanon, and likely Derrida about Algeria and the period, the periodization of 1973. Um, because so many things happen in that year, including the advent of the Black Skulls Merton formula for, for options, for an option, or for options trading in a portfolio. Um, this revolutionizes the the way finance works, even as you know financial instruments have you know they're thousands of years old. Um, this is a real a moment where the 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 fully hedged option sort of ascent you know that it can be created that it can be that this in a portfolio that this this fully hedged option can exist is if we follow um what my 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 mentor um bob meister says this is the creation of basically synthetic government bonds they're riskless assets and this seems important to me and Leotard, as he's talking about, especially in his his evil book, you know, Libidinal Economy, which comes out in 74, right? Um, he's talking about the movement of intensities, the, you know, the libidinal band as a Mobius strip that twists and turns into um, these, these volumes. Um, this seems to catch on to something that Deleuze and Guattari, Deleuze himself, does, don't quite catch on to. They're still stuck in a sort of productivist you know, machinic model that Leotard isn't. So this book is, this first book that I'm working on right now, um, inshallah, I finish it, right, um, is really about the, the de- movement from Deleuze and Black Studies into, um, into Leotard. Um, that's really all I'll say about it in that in like in terms of that but you know beyond the simply the masochism is there something outside sadism sadism and masochism uh, i mean i don't know right i it seems like the the my instinctual answer is if this is the political constellation that we're in the answer is no not right now um and that sort of demands the the Afro pessimist answers. We got to move from horticulture to pyrotechnics, or we are fucked. We have to get rid of this idea of the contract and the contracting subject as our sort of base base political mode, and burn that shit. Get rid of it. Um, so I don't know if it's if it's uh, the case that we all should want to be masochists. Um, I don't know. I'm not saying no. I'm saying I don't know. Um, But my suspicion is no. My suspicion is no. Um, This contracting, this contracting subject is part of the problem of masochism. And it's one I think we want to move away from um, if we want to be able to um, stop saying yes to all of, all of this, um, all of this violence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, the relevant, yeah, I mean, the relevant tale in Masak's story, Venus and Furs, is that he trains his dominatrix to be the perfect, you know, dominatrix. And then it's, she becomes too good at it. And, and then he loses control and he has to, um, he has to break. He has to. He has the option to break it up. At least is is kind of what's built in there. But we, you know, we don't. We might not. You know, the democracy that we fashion for ourselves, for instance, the liberal institutions that we fashion for ourselves, we might not have that ability to be like Masak and tear it up, right? Um, 
so yeah, I, but it sounds like you know because if there's it's it's either you know aligned with institutions or aligned with contracts and like a kinship role like that, or like what you're proposing sounds like or suggesting the alternative might be is is anarchy of a world where we don't have contracts um, or a, a group that is not enforcing contracts. I don't know. So these are just these are just things that I was thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, I don't know. The con- the contracting subject, the world of contracts is is so ubiquitous and so powerful. Like you know, like even just y- your friend isn't there when they say they're going to be there, and it's like you said you were going to be there in this text. That is like that is contractual thinking, right? Is you said you were going to be there. It's in writing, and it's like it's uh it's really deeply embedded in the way we think of ourselves right is i uh, you know the idea of the enforceable promise of you know we're promising subjects um that's that's a tough thing to to break with and sort of keep keep the keep the language and the world that we have like our sense of the world um intact and because it, that is our sense of the world, right? Um, is that is the bargain and the promise? And you said you were going to do this, and I said I was going to do that, and then we have to do it. And you know, I'm not saying break all your promises or don't make promises. No, no, no. But um, there, the 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 thing to think about is what do we do to sort of if we can um breach the very specific contracts that we um we all sort of live our lives through um and i you know again not between your friends and family not even really with your your sort of accepted adversaries i'm not saying that you know don't break the rules of war necessarily i'm not saying that but in terms of like the big social contract, what does breaching it look like? Um, and do you have to make yourself a monster to do it? That's really the question. And, you know, Fanon at the end of, of Wretched, in, uh, Wretched of the Earth is dealing with exactly this, right? Is the, the psychic outcomes of breaching the social contract. Um, and it's, a high price that people pay and you don't come out of it on the, uh, you don't come out the other side, the same thing. Um, you come out something different. And so there's a whole lot of, of divestment, like psychic political and psychic divestment that has to, that would have to take place to get to, to get to breaching the contract because, you know, and this is, I think potentially the great horror is that, for, you know, for black studies is that you enact this revolutionary violence, you enact this, this is the successful slave revolt. What are you on the other side? If we accept that freedom is yoked to slavery, that these things coexist, you're not going to be free. And there is even something to say, to suggest that you might not even be black on the other side. And so if you are if you are psychically and politically invested in this and this might be the thing that has to go this might be the thing that is sacrificed by breaching the social contract uh truly not just you know you know stealing cheese from whole foods i mean like really breaking the, breaching the social contract you know it, creating the option for yourself you might not be the same thing on the other side and one of the the originally this book was going to be just solely about George Jackson and Ivana Hoffman, um, who was a, a Afro German woman who went to fight in, in Syria with the YPG and was murdered. Right. Originally that was what this book was going to be about. And the both of them in there, she leaves behind a single letter and, you know, Jackson has wrote two books, right. One of their preoccupations in both of these pieces of writing is not being the same on the other side. And that is the th- that is the thing that um, makes masochists of us in in a certain way, and that is what 
while the, this book will sort of deal with that, it's that's sort of the horror at the center of it is you might you might not be the same thing on the other side. And so I can't say what that will look like. I don't know. Um, I have no idea. I'm not Adrian P Piper, you know, I haven't retired from my blackness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, another convenient or coincidental part of the Venus and First story is Massac goes through a sadistic phase once he gets angry that it all falls apart, right? Um, and he he gets on the other side of it. Um, yeah, and I, and I think, you know, it, the, the conversation of the promise, the promising subject just dovetailed really nicely with what Sean is working on with us and members, which is um, our ability, our, our free will that we're given and the theological problems of that um, and how we are held responsible for our actions. Um, and that's a bit when we've discussed that in the What is Blackness course with suddenly, you know, the, the post-emancipation, they're now responsible for everything that's wrong. Them, mm -hmm. You know, welcome to freedom. You know, you got to pick up all these yeah, pieces. So, welcome to freedom. It sucks here. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's but you know the the while the free will issue isn't my is not my pet issue. Um, man, it sucks having to be responsible for things and for things that you're not necessarily responsible for. You know. Um, Black people in the United States were not responsible for the conditions in which um, they were released from slavery, quote unquote. Um, they were not. But at the same time, that release is a is to follow City of Hartman. It is the creation of a subject that um, is meant to be responsible. And that is a, there's like a temp, there's a real temporal boundedness in that sub, in that subject, right? In that you really are, um, that all that past stuff, it, it, it's not important. We're meeting in the market right now. And yeah. the contract is about now. Yeah. There, forget all that. The, yeah. Mean anything. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, you know, the other, again, the, why masochism is so alluring is the disavowal part of it. Like you, do, mommy take the wheel, right, is kind of what was happening. Um, <laughs> and so that's, and so that's why it's alluring, perhaps, you know, in a, in a political sense. And that's like, you know, we don't want to think about having to reconstitute the sovereign and our, our, our institutions all the time. So we just kind of, again, put it, it's done. We signed it and now we can move on. Um, I mean, and that's just, a, it's, you know, it's also just so annoyingly relevant with like people like Elon Musk or online Twitter users that are like the, uh, everyone that thinks white people are the the worst ever like it the racist but we we dealt with slavery it's all gone like what are you talking about there's no there's no trauma there's no we're i'm just a white dude that's wanting to treat everyone equally there's no color etc yeah yeah well you know elon elon musk is uh if we must talk about the south african um if we must um <laughs> you know 1994 was only 30 years ago <laughs> You know, it's only 30 years ago. Uh, good try, sir. But, you know, we know we know we've heard what you, what the fa the people who work in your factory call it. We know. It kind of reminds me of the quote from Eric Williams about the English abolishing, uh, you know, creating institution of slavery solely for the pleasure of abolishing it. I mean, it's it, it sounds like the. The, I mean, this, this idea of the contract, the subject it presupposes, even not even the free will, but just the will, it's just so baked into the history of philosophy. And I think, particularly thinking about the activity of signing the contract, was it itself a kind of exertion of the body, at least in how it's represented, a kind of labour enacted on something in order to somehow externalise one's will into an artefact. And I think what's, what's so interesting, particularly thinking about slavery in this case, is that the Going back to you know the founding mythological philosopher of, of America, John Locke, you know, his idea of ownership tends to come with the mixing of one's labor with things, but the labor that the slave mixes is not under their own will, it's under the command of another. So it's like, you know, we've mixed your, you know, we've we've paid for you, we've paid for your ticket, we've mixed your labor in with this, and therefore you're party to this contract, which doesn't even exist. And it's I think in terms of sort of breaking 
I want to say breaking the spell, but sort of like getting out of the libidinal investment here. There's a there's something which is a distinction that you bring up, which I actually want to focus on just just briefly, which is when you write that to quote that you know the, the political sadist doesn't create his own political masochists. The political sadist create vic- creates victims that understand themselves as political masochists, and so there's that constitutive violence that constitutes the subject. You know, is the institution of the contract subject. I mean, is it? Would, if, would you say that, so it's like part of way of getting out of this is to recognise that this is constitutively violence. This is, in a way, already social death. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is the, that is the big thing is, is so when I came to the, when I came to the Farley paper again, the word that kept coming up for me in classic and analytic fashion is um, misapprehension is like misapprehending what you're dealing with is to me so frightening. You know, it's why, it's why being sort of surrounded by white liberals is so scary, right? It's a get out get out. You know, you're like, oh, every these people are fine. And it's like, no, 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 no. Don't make a mistake here. Um, so, but yeah, this is the big thing is that this is, is we're talking about constitutive violence. We're talking about, and violence being constitutive of the, the making of the, of the ground for the contracting subject. Right. Um, and the more it mystifies itself, the more powerful it gets. And, you know, it, it relates to what you were saying, Noah, about like, oh, you know, that's in the past. Don't worry about it. And it's like, no, this is what runs up and down. This is what like strides everything um, is this constitutive violence um, that is, it, I don't know. I don't know how, I truly don't understand how people don't see it. I, I really don't. And it's, you know, it's like, it's always a shock when people are like, well, you know, this is, it wasn't that bad. I'm like, no, it was that bad. And it's worse than you even can imagine, <laughs> you know? Um, and I should probably bring my, to my analyst that I laughed there, but um, regardless, um, it, the, the violence is constitutive in the way that the, the, natal alienation, which is such an, like the fundamental part of, of Patterson's, um, you know, um, social death is constitutive. This makes you, it's, it's the, it's the thing. Um, and turning your attention away from that and thinking, oh, well, you know, I'm just, this is, this will be over. The period of performance for this contract will come to an end or, um, that was the period of performance. Now you're, there's something new and you're not adhering to it. That the, the, the sadistic institution does not and cannot care. It does not love you. It will not love you. Um, it is not mommy taking the wheel, uh, nor is it Jesus. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's something else and it already has the wheel. Um, and, and that's really what I mean about, you know, the sadistic, the sadist does not create a masochist and they don't want each other. Um, at all, you know, it would be an, a, a, I feel as though it would be a true nightmare to walk into a scene and encounter a real sadist. That sounds awful. And to be mistaken about what you're encountering, that, that is becoming a victim, right? Um, it, it really is. And the mystification that takes place in thinking that we are, we are just, uh, we're masochists and therefore contract, look at it, read it, sign it. It, it, that doesn't stop the sadistic institution. It does not, it does not and cannot care. And so, yeah, that's, that is part of the, that misapprehension is that, is that no, 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 you're a victim, babe. (laughs) You know, it's that meme. You're a victim. Um, and it's the, like, it, and I'm not, it's not just to, you know, sort of kowtow to victim mentality or anything like this. It's, but instead to really, really recognize that the violence is constitutive and it was against you. And that's what you actually have to deal with. And that's, you know, that's part of the psychopolitics of all of this is like, 
no, no, no. The, it, the violence is not, it's not just baked in. It is the thing. It's, you know, it's the flour, the sugar, the eggs, it's the pan, it's the oven, it's the whole deal. Um, so we have to be able to look that in the face and stop understanding ourselves as, as part of this, um, as they're being, as we're, as though we're signatories to a contract too. We're not, we're just not. You took the words right out of my notes here, the word misapprehension. And, um, I think it attends to this discussion of the details, you know, regarding Deleuze's theory of the divide or the incommensurability between sadism and masochism. And I was hoping that maybe you could extrapolate this analogy even further. I mean, that that's kind of the game that we're in now, because the way that I, the one aspect of the misapprehension that I took note of was that it's, in the end, it's sadism all the right way down. But the masochism appears, and then there's this kind of connection or the forging of a force uh, of a false oppositionalism between sadism and masochism. There, you know, the, these categories are are kind of reified in a way to to make it seem as if they are opposed to one another. But when we get underneath it, part of breaking the spell, as it were, or getting out of the servitude mindset, is seeing that the recuperation of the the notion of a social contract or a pseudo contract comes from that continued buy into the imaginary of it and once we do that then we can see the real sadistic roots of it all and and one of the the analogies that i see or at least one of the connections to other places in Deleuze's work is the idea of the you know active and reactive forces and ressentiment because that's what the masochist does they internalize that violence in such a way you know, to to make themselves a receptacle for it, but it can never truly connect to the 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 bloodiest field of contestation, which is sadism against the world, <laughs> right? And I, I was wondering, and and that's and just kind of looping back to the whole discussion of of liberalism, liberal ideology, liberal politics. It's all about and reinforcing that misapprehension at the end of the day. And I, and I was wondering if there was anywhere else to go with this analogy with, with all those terms on the table. I mean, yeah. So in, I'll, I'll try to answer this maybe through, through some of the, mm, the habits and, and fixations of black studies. Um, when, you know, when the pandemic started, because you got to bring the pandemic in now, you can't, you can't avoid it, you know. Um, there was an article published, I think, by Kianga Yamada Taylor um, that was about, that said, there's this, that started with, there's this saying, and it is a saying that, you know, when, um, when America gets cold, black people get pneumonia, something like this. You know, it's, there's this, this relation that's hap that happens where these things that are, um, that are occurring in the black community sort of, and not just in the black community, I should say, but they're, they extrapolate outward in some way. And that's all fine and well, this idea, but this and this article came out sort of in response to those early days where it was like black people were not dying of COVID or not getting COVID and then were dying ferociously of COVID. And then there, you know, then it was the, you know, the, the markets even reacted to there was a huge surge in in <laughs> in the stock markets um, when it was it, it was news that really only black people were dying of COVID. Anyways huge surge. This is what really set me off, made me completely insane um, initially. But the thing about, and it's not an analogy. It's not an analogy. The thing that I'm trying to get at though, is that what can be done to black people is, is so often the testing ground for what can happen to anyone else. It's not that everyone is always eligible for for these things, be it, you know, be, certainly be it slavery, be it dying from COVID. It's not that everyone's not like just completely ineligible or or eligible, but black people often we find are eligible first 
and where sort of experimentation, research and development for how things will work, play themselves out. Okay. So I, I think maybe, you, you know, like I say, not an analogy, but certainly a place where um, certain kinds of research and development do take place. And politically, we see this too, right? We see this in, we see this with, you know, the black, the black power movement becoming the yellow power movement. And then, you know, the American Indian movement, it, the, you know, there were the Black Panthers, the Yellow Panthers, the, you know, the Young Lords that, that exploded out sort of based on this, um, this Black political experimentation with self-defense leagues, with, um, with armed resistance, with, with food programs and so on. And I say those all together because they, we should think of them all together. So it's not so much an analogy as much as it's, you know, politically, especially in the United States, what, what happens with black people, what black people do often ends up being research and development for other things. Like the point though, is to make it the case that that's not just what we're used for again, like the democratic party. Oh, we, this is where we learn. And therefore now we'd go and take it and make it our own thing. It's not about that, but instead that, you know, until black people are free, none of y'all will be free. You just won't. And that's where I'm, where, what I mean by like, you know, research and development is that there, it's not that there's an analogy, but instead if we can still be punished like this, the attention can be turned on, on others. And it often is. And so I'm not even saying, you know, black people, we have to do it first. We have to do it this or anything like that. No, there's no, not about, it's not about, you know, that kind of black excellence, but instead it's like, um, until we're free, yeah, until or not even free, until we're out of this problem, <laughs> let's not say free. Um, our eligibility for for this violence will always make other people's possible too, and it would behoove people to understand that. I think that that's what I, I think. You know. Um, the the you know to to quote another person from the member school the villi- vi- the visual technology of blackness of race um can mark one as automatically eligible but anybody can be eligible um you know white people were reduced to slavery that doesn't it's not the same thing as saying that one is structurally eligible to be a slave um that did happen uh, so I think there's there are real political lessons to be learned from from this that are not just applicable to black people. Um, however, it is a thing that in terms of an interracial or intramural discussion need to take place among among black people is that um, you know this masochistic fixation on getting the state, the institution to adhere to a contract that doesn't exist is going to get y'all killed. Um, and it's going to get us killed. And so, yeah, not analogy so much, but it, it could ramify outward if, uh, if it became the case that we were looking to, for an end to the violence in general. Yeah, absolutely. Teja, where can people find you? Where to find what your work? I mean, if you, what you've got anything coming out soon, people can read. I mean, we we did actually read uh, just before this. We did actually read a, uh, a couple of pieces you did on on Deleuze and George Jackson, and yeah, they kind of been set. I mean, I got to admit, when I picked up the folks, if you've got a copy of Anti Oedipus, go look for the footnote when they cite the line from George Jackson running whilst looking for a weapon. One, it's, it's not the correct translation, and I couldn't find it in any edition, and I got to admit, it did also short-circuit me a little bit. But, you know, it's, <laughs> but, yeah, where, where can we find your work? You know, if people want to catch up with, with what you're writing on, is there, people can go, or is there anything you're currently doing with the member school? Yeah, no, um, so the, you know, the sadistic institution has made it the case that I'm not allowed to work at the member school and be paid for it right now, uh, because I'm on a visa. 
bastards. Um, <laughs> don't listen to that State Department. I love you. Um, don't you love me back? Um, no. What What am I working on? So I'm working on right now. It's all about this this masochist option issue where I'll be dealing yes with contracts and Deleuze and and options and leotard and and blackness and the psychopolitics of blackness. So that's that's what I'm working on. That and a um, if this podcast doesn't get me into huge amounts of trouble, which it might um, because of what I've just said about everyone being a slave, um, maybe. Uh, the thing that will definitely get me into trouble is what I'm working on about Cydia Hartman and the revised edition of Scenes of Subjection, which uh, it'll come out eventually. Um, but I do have an article, uh, a feature in Parapraxis coming out in the fall, I believe, fall, winter, somewhere in there. Um, that is actually on um, Elon Musk, as it were, on the ketamine economy, um, ketamine as a drug, and um leverage and over leveraging and the white psyche um so that's what i'm writing about for them so when that comes out i guess you can read it i don't know get get mad at me if you we'll have you find, back on uh, yeah okay yeah sure um and if you want to find me i'm being nuts on twitter basically 24 7 so that's i'm should i plug my twitter i don't know we'll throw it in the show notes we're all putting that on yeah. Twitter. Yeah. Throw whatever you yeah. want in the show notes. If there's anything legally, legally worrying, don't worry. We'll we'll just we we, we can edit it out, or we can, <laughs> we can we can spit in the face and take the money. We can talk about ketamine accumulation and investment in the bladder of Elon Musk because that man oh. is probably my, knives and crystals at this point. It must but, be horrible. Like he must be in pain. He looks like he's got K cramps at all times. Like I, mean, I, I really, I really hope so. I mean, see. You know, if anyone deserves it, you know, <laughs> but on anyone that a slightly sadistic note, I want to say thank you so much for coming on the show again. It's been amazing. Thank you so much.